Uh, good morning and welcome to the third meeting of 2016 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcast system. However, you may notice that some of the committee uh, are using uh, tablets during the meeting. This is because we provide meeting papers in digital form and as this is the Environment Committee, we want to encourage that sort of practice. Um, we have apologies from Gail Ross. Um, item number one is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, the, the first item of business on the committee's agenda this morning is to consider whether to take item four in private. Do you have the agreement of the committee to do that? Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Um, so we move to agenda item two, which is the committee's approach to RPP3. Um, we understand that the government plans to lay this report in late December. However, an unintended consequence of this timing is that a potential two weeks of parliamentary scrutiny would be lost due to the Christmas and New Year recess period. Um, I'm sure members would be as keen uh, as stakeholders and other interested parties are to have maximum opportunity to consider what is a very important draft report. Um, this would, you know, we would like to have the fullest possible parliamentary scrutiny across a number of relevant committees. Uh, I would ask the committee, therefore, uh, if it's content for myself as convener to write to the Cabinet Secretary to ask if the Scottish Government might consider delaying RPP3's publication until Monday, January 9th, 2017. Has the committee so agreed? Okay, thank you very much. Um, obviously, a fuller discussion of the committee's approach to scrutiny of RPP3 will, will follow later this month. We now move to agenda item two, um, which is an evidence session with the Crown Estate in Scotland. Um, I welcome the panel. We have uh, Gareth Baird, the Scottish Commissioner. We have Ronnie Quinn, the General Manager, and Andrew Wells, the recently appointed Head of Property for Crown Estate. Um, can I particularly welcome Mr Wells along for the first time, I think it is, in that role. Convener. Um, so, uh, welcome gentlemen. Um, we have a number of questions for you, as you can imagine. And we'll start off by just having a general look at um, the operations of the Crown Estate. Um, Emma, do you wish to start on that? Yes, thanks very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, just on reviewing the report, I was just curious about whether there are any underlying reasons which could be identified for the drop in revenue in Scotland in the 2015-16 report. Yeah, um, the, 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 you're right. The, there's a marginal drop in revenue. It's, um, it's just a timing thing, and I don't think anything that's systemic attached to it. Would you be able to give us um, further information on previous years, maybe, for...? The... Um, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think we had a, a particularly high year last year. Um, the, the reports have, have all been available with that gross revenue number uh, associated with them. We can certainly go back uh, five or so years and, and provide the committee with those revenue numbers. But um, it, it's there or thereabouts, to be honest. I think um, the uh, last year's number was a particularly high number. Okay, thanks. It, you know, the, there's a lot dependent on, um, for example, the, the number of fish the, the, um, that, are, that are harvested, the, the rental income that we receive in respect of uh, certain activities that are seasonal, sometimes there are good seasons, sometimes there are bad seasons. Okay. So, so, so in a general sense, the, the direction is positive? Uh, yes, there's no... Um, yeah, I'd like to assure the committee that there's no uh, question of the Crown Estate um, denuding the, the Scottish portfolio of capital or revenue. You know, there's no, there's no underlying plan there. It's very much business as usual. Okay. Finlay Carson, do you want to come in? Um, it's a, a, just a general question on the remit. Uh, what is your the ongoing uh, ideology of the, the the Crown Estate when it's devolved with regards to you know future plans? Is it is it just a money making vehicle, or what what do you see your social uh, and and rural responsibilities? Uh, 
and just going forward rather than just money making? Uh, first of all, I, I don't think that the Crown Estate in Scotland has taken that view for, for some time now. But uh, we've taken a lead from the, the former statements that or the statements that have been made by the former former cabinet secretary that this transfer as a going concern. Uh, we are preparing plans to that effect that will uh, continue our engagement, continue our input to local communities, continue the balance of capital and revenue uh, focus. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be for the new board of the new entity to establish it and establish the direction going forward uh, under guidance from, from Scottish ministers. I wonder if I could just add to that, please. <coughs> um, the management of the assets uh, um, which the Crown Estate have undertaken over a long time now is very much being directed towards long term. So we are at all times trying to enhance those assets with a view to commercialism, they have to, uh, to, to be uh, profitable uh, for the public purse and um, the stewardship element of not taking any shortcuts in the management of those assets is very, very important. So as Ronnie correctly says, it'll be for the new board and indeed for direction from Scottish ministers to look how we go forward. But I would imagine that um, we will go forward on the same basis. This long-term view is very, very important, particularly for uh, the businesses uh, of our tenants and stakeholders and, and of course, communities. Uh, thank you, good morning to you all. Um, it, this is reassuring to hear about um, the, the long-term uh, thoughts that you've expressed uh, already th this morning. Um, in, in a previous session, I and others um, on the previous Rural Affairs Committee had asked about the um, development of a new mission statement, once, um, uh, whether it's as an interim body or, or once uh, the Crown Estates is, is um, fully devolved as far as it can be. Um, and I wonder uh, if you could explain, uh, really building on uh, Finlay Carson's question, if you could identify what that process will be and whether um, environmental stewardship and sustainable development might, um, whether there's a possibility that those might be considered as part of that mission um, to, to give a, a robust and clear um, statement. If I, just before I hand over to Andy, if I could just... Um speak about where our overarching vision at the moment is. It's not for us to determine the forward mm. strategy clearly, but um, we are very sure in our own minds about this long-term view. It's so important. If you think of, of uh, many of our tenants, for instance, the rural tenants, these are multi-generational businesses in many cases. Um, we absolutely have to have due regard to the long term for these businesses. And our stakeholders uh, in the marine estate are, are, no, are absolutely no different. Many of the activities and, uh, and initiatives that we take, that we help and deliver now, are going to have huge implications in the long term, in the environment and in the productivity of these assets. So, um, you know, I can only reassure you what our thinking is at the moment, unless we're directed uh, in a different uh, direction in the future. I sincerely hope for these assets it will be in the same vein. And so, so before Mr Wells, can, we, can, can I just pick up on that? Um, I hear what you're saying about that it's not for you to determine the future strategy, but given that you have a very detailed knowledge of how the Crown Estate has worked previously, all of you, you surely must have some thoughts on how it could work more effectively under control of the Scottish Parliament. I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but I'm sure you do. Um, in which case, what do you think, um, f freed from operating under the Crown Estate UK model, you might do uh, things differently? Well, what do you think a new approach could bring to the operations of the Crown Estate in this new world we're headed into? Thank you, Convener. If I, if I could start to address that because it's, it's not a straightforward question and it's all going to be subject, as you're mm -hmm. aware, to the caveat that it will have to be uh, informed by Scottish Ministers and indeed yourselves and the new board. However, um, 
areas that would be of interest um, would be more actively trading. There would be a uh, possibility of accessing funds by way of joint venture or co-investment, uh, looking at alternative markets and opportunities uh, for management of the asset, still within the, the, uh, the bounds of the 1961 Act, which the new entity will still have mm -hmm. to, to comply with. Um, ideally, building up some uh, capital reserve to optimise timing of further investment uh, decisions, uh, ways to incentivise and uh, encourage new entrants into uh, uh, farming and, and the rural estates, and looking at ways to support future growth in aquaculture um, consistent with Scottish, Scottish Government's policy. And that sits alongside with some of the ambitions we have for renewable energy offshore. So uh, we're actually quite ambitious about what the opportunities are going forward. And, and can I ask, uh, are you being afforded an opportunity uh, as we go through this process to feed in those thoughts? Um, again, we have, we have to be mindful of the fact that there's a lot of attention just now on the, the transfer. Mm -hmm. And um, we are looking at internally how we can inform that debate, particularly with the new board and uh, uh, preparing what, what I don't think would be uh, a good idea is to present a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at various options that we can present to that new board that they can consider. Okay, that's useful. If, if I could uh, Rina, add a little bit there um, in relation to the, the, the sort of broader functions of the, the potential for the new body. Uh, um, we believe there's, there's a huge opportunity um, to really look at how the Crown Estate can build on its values, build on its sort of combining its commercial remit with the sort of broader stewardship and sustainable objectives um, in Scotland. And we certainly feel that we can become, become more collaborative, that uh, uh, you know, a sort of a broader partnership approach, working with a wide range of stakeholders and communities could be something that could be brought into the DNA of the, the new organisation so that we can you know, work harder to achieve that balance between commercial objectives and, and adding value in, in lots of other different ways. Issue about balancing the um, the needs of our existing uh, tenants and customers as well, uh, and keeping a steady ship, if you like, in, over over this period. Uh, the, uh, you know, going back to the previous statement of business as usual and going concern, very keen to keep keep focus on that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Okay, this is appropriate then to move on to looking at the transition um, in management arrangements. Uh, Alexander Burnett. Uh, good morning. Um, it's a question that I'll be repeating to the, to the next panel uh, on what value is being transferred uh, to Scotland, uh, but really on, on valuation and due diligence. Uh, can I ask yourselves uh, what you put behind the property value uh, that you write about here uh, and uh, to what level is that done? Uh, there are various methods of valuation, whether it's statutory valuation, red book valuation, uh, um, a more cursory look, you know, look around a farm in terms of uh, the rural sector. Uh, can I just ask what work you've done on valuation uh, and, and also in particular maybe what changes in some valuation, especially with, in likes of the tenanted property you've seen, uh, and also what figures you might have in terms of improvements that have been requested uh, to improve uh, um, the income and profitability of some of the enterprises uh, when you talk about looking at the long-term uh, viability of these places. Take the first part and then hand over to Andy about um, some of the specifics. But um, so far as the valuation is concerned, it's read book, uh, it's done independently, um, and it's assessed uh, and is part of the, the Crown Estate audited, audited report. Um, so this is an extract, if you like, of that. So we, if we take the offshore world, for example, um, if there's no activity on the seabed, it's not valued. Um, the valuers have quite a heavy discounting policy with regards to projects that haven't yet reached FID. Once they've reached financial close, then the valuation goes up. Once they're built, it goes up again. But until then, there's quite a, a low value attributed to it as an opportunity value. Uh, the 
it's different values we use for different areas, as you'd expect. So the rural valuation um, is done differently from, for example, the cables and pipelines valuation, which is in turn diff done differently from the, the renewables valuation. So it, it's done red book and it's done independently. Uh, our input to that is, is really only advisory as to saying what stage various things are at and, and wh wh what the estate is. The, the valuations are normally done um, uh, late in the year and in the first quarter of the year. Uh, as to as to future investments and um, yes, and, and as Ronnie says, I mean the rurals um, is, is done according by external valuers, uh, professional valuers um, uh, who do it by the red book. Um, in terms of investments, clearly when we make decisions around investments in particular properties, uh, we take a view as to what impact that will have on valuations. Um, it's within our responsibilities to in, uh, enhance the capital value in the longer term. Uh, so we would be sort of making decisions on that basis. I'm going to let uh, Mark Roscoe in here with apologies. I should have allowed them in earlier. Just to <clears throat> follow on from that, I mean, you've, you've talked about the way where you want to take the organisation, the areas of growth. What, what kind of structures and changes in practice are then required to achieve that? Um, you know, we just had a question about valuation. I'm aware that with a new interim body, you'd be moving towards uh, an audit committee uh, governing your, 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 uh, your financial risks. So what, what kind of changes are you going to have to put in place in terms of the management of the organisation, how are you going to work with these new structures? The Crown State has been quite active in, in setting up the Scotland portfolio as a standalone separate accounting business unit. So we've been operating on that basis from 1st April. We have uh, recruited a new management team. Uh, so we now have, uh, we've brought in a finance manager, Lynn Higgins. We have uh, a, a communications, head of communications, Esther Black. So we, we've, we've um, reformed a management team. We have brought in HR as well. That management team, I believe, is structured to perform uh, what we're doing just now and can flip across into the new entity and take, take that new entity forward. Uh, I have every confidence in that. We've identified a couple of additional um, support areas where that new entity would uh, need support uh, and identified new posts. We've advised our colleagues in Scottish Government of, of, the, of those areas. It's things like uh, company secretariat duties, uh, freedom of information, knowledge management, <coughs> that type of thing. But so for the actual day-to-day -day business and, and ongoing business, uh, we've taken steps to, to form that team to make that as self-sufficient as we possibly can. At this stage, uh, we're uh, putting a lot of effort and, and uh, money, in fact, into creating uh, our own IT environment. And the intention is that that will be up and running uh, by the end of this calendar year so that we uh, are targeting the transfer date of 1st of first April for day one of the, the new entity. We have every confidence that we will get there uh, from, from the Crown Estate side and have, have that environment ready to, to flip across. So, so how much support will you require to service these new governance structures? I mean, in particular, you know, you've got an audit committee, you've got a board, uh, you know, board papers need to be produced, yep. things need to be considered, audit committees need to be reported on, scrutiny has to take place. That, that's quite different from where you are right now. So how many extra people would you need to bring in to service the new governance structure surrounding the interim body? I, I think it's fair to say we, we, we do service committees at present. Um, what we identified, however, is a new role of corporate uh, secretary to help uh, service and administer the committees and the board going forward. So that is at least, we've identified at least one and a half, if not two, FTEs. If, I wonder right. if I could add to that, Mr. Ruskell. Um, um, over the last few years, uh, in one form or another, there has been an increasing degree of autonomy uh, in the Scottish operation, and we, uh, our Scottish management board now um, is very well equipped to take this forward. Uh, there was just a wee bit I wanted to, about whilst it is for the new board and indeed Scottish ministers to determine absolutely our, uh, our route forward now. What I would say is that um, we have uh, increased our level of communication 
for everyone's benefit with our stakeholders over the last few years, um, we were uh, made aware that there was uh, deficiencies in that area and we've worked very hard and I really think we're seeing the benefit of that now. What I can say to you is amongst the, the senior management team at Bells Bray is there's a, a real appetite for more collaboration with stakeholders and we've seen examples of this um, over the last year or so. Um, an example of that would be um, in, with our Glenlivet rural tenants, we had a, uh, an issue with cryptosporidium, uh, which actually wasn't anything to do with uh, our tenants' livestock, it was coming out of deer, but the Morden Research Institute went up to uh, discover uh, the root of that uh, infection. Um, whilst this was going on, it was very clear that there was a, a very strong appetite between both scientists and farmers to discover more about it. Now, this has led on uh, over um, the course of about 18 months to knowledge transfer seminars, um, to farm visits, and I have to say that the farm tenants, uh, our tenants and the more than research scientists have engaged in this fully. This culminated in um, the issue of a biosecurity device with a joint venture between the Morden Institute and the Crown Estate to all Scottish livestock farmers this year. I happen to be a, a livestock farmer myself and the, the advice and technical expertise that's come forward on this could well provide a quantum leap in, in red meat production in Scotland. This is something we've been looking for before for a long time. So this is an example of how Without enormous uh, investment, just that's collaboration. A, that's a lot of work, isn't it? So it is a lot of work. Do you outsource some of that, or you know? Andy, can you? Well, the, the project was um, developed through our sort of broader stewardship and partnership working, um, and we have a relationship with with Morden, whereby our tenants can actually get up to date access by phone, but to Morden scientists as part of a sort of corporate membership. Um, and this particular project was done and delivered by Morden scientists. Uh, we helped fund it. Um, the work has brought together uh, a huge amount of up-to-date information um, about biosecurity, the, the key livestock diseases in Scotland, and pre presented it, and that's the important thing, presented it in a format which is easily digestible uh, by, by farmers. Um, so will hopefully make a significant difference to the management of on-farm biosecurity in Scotland. Mm -hmm. okay, just picking up on that, I mean, there's an example of, of good practice in terms of dealing with external providers, but you operate, as I understand, a system where you have land agents doing your factoring on your rural estates. Could you outline for us how well you think that works and how much money Crown Estate Scotland might spend every year on extend, external provision of that nature? In terms of, of how the system works, it, it, for, for most purposes it, it works very well, very smoothly, by employing external firms of managing agents. We, we buy into um, a huge amount of expertise uh, from people who are working uh, broadly in the rural sector. Um, and we can apply and use that expertise in relation to our management. Um, clearly, it, um, you know, it, 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 um, it, it involves a wide range of different management activities and our managing agents have to act on our behalf in a lot of different circumstances, both in terms of negotiations of, of rent reviews with tenants, in terms of liaising with local communities, in terms of re managing repairs and maintenance on farms. And they have a lot of uh, local and detailed knowledge, um, work with a lot of contractors, can make efficiency savings in how they, they, they organize that work. So it is of beneficial um, uh, um, uh, benefit to the organization to have access to that, um, that, that, that service. Um, I'm afraid I can't give you a figure. Um, it's something I can provide for the committee in terms of the exact cost of that across the board. Um, we do review this from time to time, obviously, uh, and we're constantly looking and working with our managing agents at ways in which we can reduce that cost as we would as part of you know, good business activity. Okay. I think it's also fair to say that the, the cost of providing some of the, our, uh, these services in-house uh, mm -hmm. could be prohibitive. Uh, we, we call on some of these very specialist services very rarely, uh, and to have that uh, in-house, if you like, would be probably an inefficient 
an inefficient way to run the business. Okay. okay. You, you, I wonder, could I just add a, a, a bit to that? Uh, I'm a tenant farmer myself, so um, the relationship between agent and tenant, as everybody will know, can often be rather fraught. And um, I can assure you that I keep a, a very close watch on how our agents are engaging with our stakeholders. It really is very, very important. A good relationship will produce a lot of dividends for both parties. A bad relationship uh, can get toxic very quickly. Um, and I'm delighted to say that um, our team uh, issues very strict um, methods of engagement with our tenants. And I, genuinely, I think that those are upheld. Okay. You, so sorry. If I could just add to that in relation to uh, the, the Crown Estate team in Bells Bray, you know, they're, they're a very experienced team with a, with a lot of expertise and who have worked for many, many years with, with managed agents and also spend time uh, with our tenants and out on the estate, not always with managed agents, so that they can get a sort of a, a perspective coming back from our tenants in relation to how the managed agents are working. Okay, that's just, you pick up on something, you, you mentioned contractors there. And we hear anecdotally of, of um, perhaps small-scale local contractors choosing not to seek Crown Estate work because they believe the process around that is complicated, it's time-consuming. Do you find that yourselves? Do you accept that your process perhaps puts the small local guy off from trying to tender for work? I think we have had issues because of our financial systems sometimes in relation to the requirement for contractors to meet the, the conditions that we, we set and some of the smaller contractors do find that difficult. We try and help them wherever we can and try and sort of um, ensure that we do use local contractors whenever we possibly can. Is that something you think there's an opportunity to look at again as you transfer over to, to Scotland? There's always that opportunity to review how we do things, and certainly going forward, we'll be a smaller business. The financial systems we have in place currently are sort of designed for a large UK business. I think going forward, certainly our, our new systems will, will potentially be more straightforward and uh, will hopefully enable us to um, operate more efficiently in that, in that sense. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Right. Uh, thank you, Convener. Could, could I just ask you in relation to... Um, tenant farmers. We had a, a very interesting day when um, we were welcomed uh, to Dumfries and Galloway, to the Applegarth Estate. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could make any comment on whether there would be any concerns from your perspective about investment, um, capital investment particularly, um, uh, in uh, tenanted farms in, in the interim period, um, or that period leading up to it. Um, and if we could see um, perhaps some figures on that, if, um, if that's possible. Um, yes, in terms of sort of reassuring um, our tenants, clearly it's our ambition to um, operate as largely as much as we can as business as usual as we move through the transition process. There are some um, challenges around that, as we, as we know, in relation to when we start um, uh, the new body. Um, we'll be looking at the business from a Scotland perspective only, uh, and that um, has implications for, for, for cash flow. And it, it's a cash flow issue um, that we, we need to sort of plan for uh, and work through. Um, in terms of our sort of overall um, capital investment, you know, we've invested 12.3 million in the last, um, since 2010 in the rural estates. That's roughly around 2.2 million on average every year. Um, it does fluctuate from year to year depending on investment requirements across the portfolio. Um, some years it's around about 1.1, other years it's been up to 3 plus million and that's purely as a result of um, to, um, certain, certain circumstances, weather related capital requirements for investment in buildings uh, and the sort of pipeline of development um, that's in progress which causes that fluctuation. We've budgeted around about 2.2 million of investment for this financial year and we're expecting a similar figure um, for next year. We haven't yet developed the, the, so the full cash flow position, for the, for, but we're working on that at the moment. Um, we also have a, a pipeline of, of sales, which is an ongoing part of our act activity. It's part of the general uh, management of the Crown Estate, both UK and in Scotland, to be um, looking at um, sales so that we can raise capital for reinvestment in the property. Um, We've identified a number of those as part of our normal business planning um, and 
you know, subject to market conditions and um, you know, that, that, that program uh, being put, put through in practice. We're, we're confident that we can cover our capital requirements um, uh, in, in the first year of operation. The initial, um, when we first transfer, there may be initial uh, problems with cash flow, but we're working very closely with the Scottish Government in terms of how we handle that. Right, thank you. Just, um, it would be helpful if, if you're not able to, um, to give us details of, of this today, if you were able just to reassure the committee by writing to us about um, possibly any um, requests for either joint um, uh, investment, capital investment uh, with tenant, with rural tenants um, over the, the last two years and uh, going into the future with the interim body um, and whether those have been able to be taken forward and on what basis that would be helpful I think just in terms of reassuring us as a committee. Certainly very happy to do that. Thank you. Also uh, including that uh, giving us an understanding of how you monitor your performance in responding to tenants' requests for improvements. Because I think the figure you touched upon there about investment in rural estates wouldn't just be about the farms. It would be things like going live at about the mountain bike trails that you've built, that sort of thing, where you've invested very effectively. What we're trying to get to here is how does the Crown Estate interact with its tenants when you're getting requests for perfectly reasonable re repairs? How do you judge if and when to carry these out, and um, it, bluntly, is there a backlog uh, that's going to have to be cleared uh, under the new regime? We have a sorry, that was feedback there. We, ha we have a rolling program of repairs and maintenance, and this is identified each year by our managing agent teams, who have, as I mentioned earlier, a sort of detailed knowledge of the properties and the requirements, and will liaise with tenants regarding the repair and maintenance. That, that um, figure has been continuing at roughly the same level for the, um, the, the last few years, and we expect uh, we're budgeting again for a similar level next year. There is always a requirement for ongoing repairs and maintenance, uh, and it is a matter of identifying what the requirements are for each holding, what our financial position is, um, and managing it accordingly. Okay. If I could just add that the criteria that we would normally consider for repairs uh, would be the age of the structure, its use, is it used seasonally or is it central to the unit as a whole functioning, any health and safety considerations or is a light for light repair actually the best solution uh, and in some instances um, that repair request actually prompts us to reconsider the whole unit uh, and work with the tenant on a wider investment or a restructure of that unit. So th there's a number of criteria we take into account there. If um, we were to respond to absolutely every request that came in, that would be a substantial burden uh, on, on the estate. And, and if I could just add, just in terms of the figure, it's around about £390,000 per annum in repairs and maintenance across the, the rural portfolio. And also worth adding that a lot of work we've been doing recently is in relation to asbestos related work and to electrical wiring inspections and meeting new standards that um, are required. Okay, we've got a number of members wanting to come in with brief supplementaries. Uh, Finlay Carson followed by Mark Roscoe. Thank you, uh, convener. I, I suppose it's in the back of uh, what Claudia Beamish mentioned earlier on with uh, the mission statement. Um, what pressure are you going to be under to make the right sort of sales uh, looking at the business going forward, you, you're going you're to have a, a, a quite a, a urgent need to, to generate income uh, to keep, keep the business going over this transition period. What pressures are, are, are on you to, to preempt what the mission statement is going to be to, to, uh, to influence what your, your sales are going to be in this short term? I could perhaps just clarify and make a distinction between capital and revenue. So far as revenue is concerned, there are, there are absolutely no concerns there, and I think the, the revenue position will be very straightforward very early on. So I don't foresee any reason for a, a revenue uh, issue, and of course it's revenue that's used in, in, in the maintenance of, of properties, so that isn't an issue. Where, where we do foresee, and, and it's something that uh, we're in very active discussion with colleagues in the Scottish Government about, is the capital position which we've identified and where do we get the capital, the liquid capital to invest uh, and that's going to be subject to uh, an ongoing programme. This is going to be business as usual as, as far as we can possibly make that. 
um, and we'll, we'll identify as part of normal business where we can take opportunities uh, and, and uh, optimise those. Going back to your relationship with tenants again, I mean, you know, Gareth, you said, you know, you've got an intuitive understanding of that, being a tenant yourself, um, but to what extent do you kind of systematically benchmark against other public bodies? And if I was a tenant of the Forestry Commission, would I expect the same kind of level of service or response to questions or requests for investment as I would from the Crown Estate? Um, where's the good practice here? If, 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 I, could, if I could perhaps give some... Um, concrete numbers here, uh, perhaps not directly for the rural estate, but um, where we, we carry out time, from time to time surveys of tenants. Uh, recently, we, we had one in uh, 2014 for coastal tenants, where 70% of the customers rated the current estate uh, good or excellent in terms of overall customer satisfaction. For energy in 2020, uh, uh, 15, 2016, there was a 69% return that customer service was good or excellent. Uh, we'll be con conducting further UK-wide studies this year. Uh, but is that, that just about looking at the relationship with your own tenants, or would you look at benchmarking within the wider public sector as well? Would you, would you have a benchmarking operation with Forestry Commission to look at their practices and then look at your practice and see we'd, which we'd, is delivering greater yeah. tenant satisfaction and maybe borrow from each other? We don't have a, it's fair to say we don't have a direct uh, dialogue with Forestry okay. Commission. So you don't do benchmarking across other public sector organisations? Uh, not in respect of that. Right. We, do, okay. we do do benchmarking in respect of financial return. Right. And uh, the Crown State performs very well in respect of those benchmarks. The IPD benchmark we, we, term, we normally exceed. Okay. Uh, Kate Forbes. Um, just continuing the theme of tenancies. What is the process when a uh, tenancy becomes available? And how are, are you doing much to encourage new entrants to take up tenancies? Yeah, the process um, clearly um, is one which depends on the sort of, um, nature of the unit that is becoming available, its size, its scale, the sort of the fixed equipment, the, the, the sort of fertility of the holding, that sort of thing. Um, and we would take into account a wide range of factors, including the requirements of existing tenants, maybe neighbours and, and their businesses and what, um, what, what they, they're, they're, they're potentially um, would, would be seeking if an opportunity arose. So we would take a view um, in relation to the nature, say, that, that, that what, what opportunities there were in relation to whether the unit would be um, suitable for reletting on the open market, whether um, it um, actually would lend itself better to sort of being um, relet within the estate to existing tenants. Um, depending on that decision, um, you know, we would um, first look at whether or not it was a, an opportunity for a starter unit, um, and if not, then um, we would look at um, a, a different decision in, re in relation to that. We recently relet a farm at the Fockers Estate, uh, Den Farm, which uh, provided an opportunity for a young farmer to, to get on uh, up the, the farming ladder. Um, so it often depends on, on the individual circumstances of the unit. I wonder, could I just add a comment to that? Um, uh, as you'll understand, it's pretty close to my heart about how um, uh, particularly younger generations getting in, into farming. I think there's two aspects to, to add to what Andy said. Um, we have been very rigorous in looking at business plans of applicants for tenancies. Uh, I know all too well in my industry, uh, some people will really push the boat out, perhaps to their own detriment in the future. So we've been very rigorous in that regard. I, I think the other part of it I would like to say is that... Um, People, members will be aware that the average age of farmers in Scotland is climbing horribly. And there is an issue about allowing um, tenants or, or farmers in general to exit the industry uh, with capital and pride. And sometimes when uh, farming businesses come on uh, hard times, we can help in that regard a wee bit. So, so that if you like, that gets uh, the potentially the older generations of the family out of the business, allows the younger ones to come in. And the other thing I would say that Andy made reference to is that we will look at the viability of a unit that comes up for 
tenancy. So perhaps it's not big enough, perhaps it's not fertile enough, perhaps it needs to be bigger. And we will use that opportunity to recalibrate that unit when it's needed. So it's very much this business perspective coming in. It's not there to grab heaps of rent all the time. It's got to be ongoing for the future. Uh, Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, convener. I, um, I, I recognise that the financials are important and such as the committee's questioning along those lines, but um, certainly from a Scottish point of view, we've got to recognise that there are aspects beyond the balance sheet, particularly around uh, natural capital, and I wonder how that is currently being integrated into particularly rural estates and forestry and whether uh, there might be opportunities to, to further uh, integrate that into your strategies going forward. Certainly, um, in terms of um, how it's currently dealt with, um, the Crown Estate is actually one of the industry leaders in relation to how it has measures and uh, its added value through our sort of total contribution and integrated reporting. Um, we're about to um, launch a, a second um, version of our total contribution report later this year, and that has sort of looked at the value creation beyond purely financial returns that the business generates as a whole in a, in a range of different sectors, and one of which includes uh, sort of natural uh, resources. Going forward, and certainly in the new business, um, uh, it's a real opportunity for us to look at how we can help to sort of capture and, and understand the value that we as a land business generate, and certainly working with our partners and, and stakeholders, how we can help our tenants to sort of understand their impact on, on the natural um, resource base as well. We're currently working a project um, up with Scottish Land and Estates, with SNH, with Scottish Wildlife Trust, um, and potential other partners looking at how the new natural capital protocol which was launched last year uh, in, in July um, which is a global protocol which is um, aiming to help businesses understand their dependencies on natural capital and to um, the process at which they can use to help to measure and capture the value that they create and their impact. Um, so this project um, is, is in a scoping stage at the moment um, and we hope going forward that we can continue to develop that work and actually really help to um, you know, develop that in Scotland so that land-based businesses um, can be provided with a set of tools using the Natural Capital Protocol to um, cap uh, sorry, understand the dependencies and, 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 and measure the value they create. And would you consider the further integration of that into rental agreements because one of the advantages you have as a, the overseeing body with a number of, of tenants is that you can you can build in holistic benefits for the for the wider environment because you have a, a number of uh, tenants that that you have a relationship with and do you see it that as a more informal uh, communications role or, or or something that could be uh, more formalized in terms of your relationships uh, with tenants because i think it's only the the, the bigger um, landowners such as yourself that are able to to integrate that approach yes i th i think it's you know perhaps a bit early to say how we could mm -hmm. sort of actually make material changes to tenancy arrangements mm -hmm. in relation to how, mm -hmm. how that happens. But certainly when it comes to sort of working with our tenants um, uh, to develop these processes, to help them understand it as a large landowner, it's, it's something you know, we have the capacity to do and it's something that we would hope to, cont to do in, in, in the new entity. Can I, can I ask, um, we know for example that there have been concerns expressed by your farm tenants about what the future model will be and how that will impact upon them. To what extent are you um, taking on board those concerns and articulating them in your discussions with the government about the way forward? Are you representing those concerns that are being brought to you? Yeah. I, I think it's fair to say, convener, that um, we recognise that the, any future model is one for, for Scottish ministers. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that our tenants uh, through their stakeholder groups, uh, attend the Cabinet Secretary Stakeholder Advisory Group, etc., and uh, we're aware that they are making representations directly through that group. So it's been done by that means? 
uh, primarily, yes. Uh, we're, we're cutting out the middleman, as it were, okay. and um, the, the stakeholders are, are responding directly. Okay. David Stewart, I think, wants to come in at this point. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kavir. Can I just move on to the issue around uh, coastal issues? Um, what, what lessons can we learn from the foreshore sale to the Callaway Estate Trust? We can learn that it's a, a positive um, move. Um, we respond positively to requests from communities for acquisition of the foreshore. Um, the Callaway Estate acquisition was, was um, a very positive, as I said, um, uh, opportunity for, for, for uh, during the buyout of that particular estate. Um, we have not had too many other requests, but certainly think uh, we're very happy to sort of to look at those when they come forward. Mm. Um, well, generally, we, we work um, very closely with a lot of the co coastal communities through the provision of local management agreements, um, of which there are eight, um, which really create an opportunity for communities to come forward when they have proposals that involve mm. management of the foreshore uh, and, and, and the coastal environment. Mm. Um, these have been very successful. We also, through our marine officers, um, working for Bidwells, are one of our managed agent companies, um, who are, there are four marine officers around the, the Scotland who work very closely with, with, with coastal communities um, and have been very proactive at um, assisting mm. with um, the development of mooring associations uh, to help communities to actually manage moorings um, in, in, their, in their local area. Uh, and these have also been very successful. Mm. I think this was the first community land organisation that acquired the foreshore. Would you do anything differently in the future? I think, again, that will be very much a matter for sort of general policy within, within the new body. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it would be a continuing policy to look at how we can... Um, uh, how communities can acquire foreshore if, if there's mm. a demand there. Mm. And if, uh, just uh, earlier today, I received a letter from the three island authorities, Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland, who are very interested, as you know, in the control of the seabed and the foreshore. Uh, does it require the island's legislation to go through before they were able to acquire the foreshore? Um, not necessarily if the foreshore was, um, if there was a demand and we have to take a sort of strategic look at, um, at, 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 at foreshore sales in terms of how they um, may impact on other activities. Mm. Um, but uh, th there shouldn't be any barrier to acquisition if there is um, a, a mm. demand. That's interesting. I think it's also fair to say, however, that we are still bound by the terms of 1961 Act and are required to obtain best value for that, so th th that, that's not something that we can negotiate, that's, that's, that's a requirement that we have, a legal responsibility that we have uh, at this time. And presumably that test was met in the case of the Carloway Estate Trust? Indeed. Okay. Um, Mr. Mr. Wells earlier in another context talked about a pipeline of sales. Is the same true for the foreshore? Uh, no, because the demand from communities has not sort of come forward in, in that sense. Mm. And my final point in this uh, context, uh, convener, there is, of course, um, other local authorities, apart from the island authorities, which I strongly support, incidentally, um, who'd also be interested in the foreshore, for example, Agile and Butte and Highland Council. Would that be something you would consider if they made applications to you? Indeed. Right, thank you. OK, thanks. And one final question in this section, um, Angus MacDonald. Convener, just while we're on um, coastal issues and, and the islands have been mentioned, um, you, you may have heard uh, Good Morning Scotland th this morning in which uh, Councillor Gordon Murray from the Western Isles Council discussed his petition calling for an emergency towing vessel to be stationed um, on the west coast. Um, clearly the protection of the, the Crown Estate's assets uh, should be paramount and uh, as we heard yesterday, Unfortunately, the Marine and Coast Guard Agency refused to reinstate the emergency towing vessel uh, for the west coast of Scotland. Now, um, would that be an issue that the Crown Estate could consider in the future, perhaps paying a share of the cost of an ETV vessel uh, on the west coast, uh, or should that be an issue that could be left to local authorities uh, come uh, the devolution of assets? Crown Estate assets. If I may, the, the revenue coming from the Crown Estate assets will, in its entirety, go to, go to Scottish ministers. If Scottish ministers want to use that for that purpose, then that would be an ideal way of doing so. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious we, we still have some areas around coastal to cover, so uh, Kate Forbes. Uh, 
Um, so how are you managing your coastal stakeholders, the ports, harbours and marinas at the time of transition? And then part two, how do you envisage developing these assets in terms of two objectives? One, in terms of conservation, and then two, in terms of marine tourism. In terms of how we're, the first part of the question, how we're, we're managing that, it's, it's in line with our business as usual um, contact through our managed agents and our internal team with our key stakeholders. Uh, so we're maintaining uh, regular relations working um, with, 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 with stakeholders in that respect. So that's, that's a business-as-usual process, and we'll continue to put more effort into that in the, in, in the intervening period to, up to devolution to ensure, as with our farm tenants, that they're kept informed of progress. In terms of how the development of the, the marine assets are taken forward in, in future, um, clearly there's opportunity in relation to marine tourism and the Crown Estate has been very active in relation to how it has supported um, the, the marine tourism um, survey uh, and we, we, we part funded that and in working with the um, Scottish Government in relation to the marine tourism development strategy. Um, so that work will continue and again it will be a matter for the, the, the new body to sort of look strategically at how we can take that whole agenda forward. Cool. Uh, Keeping tenants advised of the transitional process is concerned. Uh, we're, we've engaged fairly formally in respect of that. We, we wrote out to tenants, uh, I think, December, during the springtime, then more, more recently in July, uh, to keep them advised as to what the, the transitional pro process is. And we'd propose to keep that, that um, engagement on, ongoing. Uh, I think in addition to that uh, formal writing, uh, all the members of staff, all the, the managing agents and indeed the, the coastal officers are, are entrusted to, to keep tenants advised when, whenever they're in a meeting with them, which is quite frequently. If I could add to that the marine officers, are, you know, they are members of the local, local community. They, they work very actively um, within, within these communities. There's two to three visits a week from all the officers around the coastline. They're mariners. They have hugely experienced in relation to coastal issues. They've been an immensely valuable resource to us in terms of how we have continued that, that engagement um, at that level. Vimesh. Uh, thank you. Um, it, it's really just to, uh, to clarify whether uh, you see that there's any role um, for the interim body uh, in helping to take forward effective marine planning with the new national marine plan and the pilot um, regional plans in terms of support with any... Um, any revenue, whether that's a, a, an appropriate thing that you've been considering at all? Any Crown Estates revenue to support taking forward the, the National Marine Plan, the, those objectives? So far as revenue is concerned, uh, as I said previously, the, the revenue from the new entity will, will be uh, apothecated to, to Holyrood, to, to the consolidated fund here, and it would be for... Uh, Parliament to decide how, how, that's, how that goes forward. What I can say is that we continue to work with colleagues in Marine Scotland on uh, several joint projects, um, particularly with regards to renewables. Uh, there's one project in respect of offshore renewables, joint industry project or programme for offshore wind, and there's a, a, an equally snappily titled one for uh, ocean energy. Uh, whereby we've collaborated with Marine Scotland, with um, uh, industry and with uh, other uh, UK government agencies to, to put funding into, uh, into to various projects and programmes. In addition, we've been happy to support uh, Marine Scotland uh, with uh, access and use of our marine planning tool uh, to, to help assist in, in that. Okay, thanks. We'll move on to forestry now. Finlay Carson, do you have some questions around this? Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, what relationship uh, has uh, the Crown Estate currently got with the Forestry Commission? Um, and, and what does the, the, the forestry business plan look like over the last few years in regards to, to growing the business and employment? Um, and is there a, a case that uh, the, the forestry side of the Crown Estate could actually transfer to the likes of the Forestry Commission? Forestry in, in, in our Scottish uh, portfolio extends to around about 5,000 hectares. That's across the sort of four rural estates, just to help you with a bit of background to sort of forestry. Um, 
most of that is, is at Glenlivet, about 3,000, just over 3,500 hectares uh, is at Glenlivet. So the, the, the rest of the forestry estate is fairly fragmented, um, uh, uh, 600 hectares also at Applegirth, and then the other bits and pieces at Whitehill and Fockabers. Um, on the, on the s outside Glenlivet uh, and Applegirth, these woodlands tend to be fairly um, fragmented. They're sort of estate woodlands, a lot of them serve as sort of shelter belts for surrounding agricultural land and they're sort of very integrated into the agricultural estate. Uh, Glenlivet is the sort of uh, the core of our sort of commercial forestry um, and, and Applegirth as well uh, uh, in, in Scotland and we work uh, very, very closely with the Forestry Commission in relation to the development of the long-term forest plans for those for all, for all our holdings. We have long-term 20-year plans in place for their management. That management um, is very much focused on um, integrating multiple use um, management um, uh, ambitions uh, and long-term restructuring of the, the woodland resource. Um, so we have an ongoing program of thinning and felling across these areas. And as I said, we work very closely with the commission on, 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 on the management of, of those areas. Um, we also invest very heavily in sort of broader public benefit in forestry. As we've mentioned the mountain bike trails at Glenlivet, which have been very successful. We've put in a lot of other visitor infrastructure, footpaths, trails, um, car parks, interpretation, education. We have a dedicated ranger service at Glenlivet, which um, undertakes a huge amount of educational work with, with, with local schools um, and uh, providing facilities for visitors. So it's, it's very much multiple use. Um, we've been recognised on a large number of forestry awards for, for the sort of sustainable management of our woodland asset. Um, they're all certified through the, 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 the Forestry um, Stewardship Forest Stewardship Council, so they're, they're under the UK Woodland Assurance Standard, which verifies sustainable management as well. Um, going forward, um, certainly again, it, we would hope to continue that management in, in, in the new body, um, whether it was appropriate for transfer of those assets to the Forestry Commission or um, that would be a matter for the for the new body to consider. Um, is, is that something that, that, that you're looking to do at the moment, look at the potential of um, possible savings with a, a transfer? Uh, the, again, looking at our forest assets will, will be um, part of our whole sort of strategic review of the, 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 the portfolio. Um, and whether there's opportunity for trading those, some of those assets um, as part of providing the capital fund for, 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 for the new business, it will be, that will be something we will consider with other potential um, asset sales as well. And I think it's also fair to say that, that those, those assets are managed as part of a profit centre currently, and uh, we would look to continue that. Uh, Maurice Golden. Um, obviously, on the Apple Girth estate, uh, a number of tenant farmers have installed uh, biomass uh, facilities and they're using externally sourced uh, biomass uh, for those. Uh, again, on the Apple Girth estate, there's a Crown Estate managed forestry that produces uh, biomass and thinking from a, from a carbon point of view in terms of the transport costs. I wonder if you could shed any light on that and whether there was any plans that Th those two demand and supply could somehow be interlinked? There's always opportunity for that. You'll be aware from your visit that um, we have a very large sort of industrial um, bio plant very close to the Applegirth mm -hmm. estate at um, Stevens Croft. And clearly uh, our timber um, is, it goes into there and transport is, 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 is very short. So mm -hmm. um, th there is always opportunity for small scale biomass uh, mm -hmm. and it's something that we, you know, we're very happy to look at. We've over the years um, have uh, undertaken biomass trials with uh, various um, uh, agencies, Forestry Commission in the past up at Glenlivet. We have a, uh, a, our own sort of wood fuel heater on our estate at Glenlivet mm -hmm. and we support a local business who harvests our timber and then sells the chip back to us to heat our um, information centre. So it's, it's certainly something you know, we, we're very happy to sort of consider. I think just in terms of obviously supporting, I appreciate that from a logistical point of view, it's easier to deal with one big supplier and I appreciate that's a, 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 a local uh, arrangement, but I think there's, it's incumbent upon um, all um, agencies to look at small businesses, tenant uh, farmers, and look at going the extra mile to perhaps facilitate 
smaller contracts, which are logistically a little bit more tricky, but ultimately make a lot more sense. Indeed, if, if going back into the early 1990s, we, we did very, something very similar at Glenlivet, where we um, worked with a local farm tenant. Um, we identified a lot of small forestry blocks around the estate that were uneconomic to um, harvest in conventional terms. And we actually facilitated him to diversify his farm business, put in a, a wood cutting machine, um, sell um, timber that he had actually harvested himself um, for a small local market. So that was a direct example of something we did over 10 years ago. So we're always looking at these sort of opportunities. We also have a, a, um, a contract in place with Estover Energy to supply the new Macallan distillery via plant at the CHP plant at. Um, um, sorry, at Macallan Distillery. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> um, so um, that's something that we, we know, and that will be low-value timber coming out of Glenlivet, which we will supply into that contract. And how long are those, I mean, in general terms, how long are your contracts with? So, you know, when would the opportunity be uh, presented to, to relook at that? Have you, is it a 5 plus 2 contract or...? Well, actually, the contract with Estover is is over 12 years, okay. um, and that will um, again deal with a lot of the uh, Glenlivet. The particular issue we have is we have a lot of um, historical planting, post-war planting of very low-value timber, which doesn't um, easily um, go into sort of traditional markets. Mm -hmm. A very low value lodgepole pine so the the biofuel market is a very um you know good opportunity to be mm -hmm. supplying that and the volumes that we have up there is substantial so mm -hmm. the, the this contract we have with with estover is actually a, a very small part of the actual resource mm -hmm. that we have available so we're not bound into okay. or tied into uh, or sorry that should that doesn't prevent us supplying other suppliers if we so wish okay okay that's fine can we move on to the issue of aquaculture and Kate Forbes is going to take that forward. Thank you. Um, earlier on, you mentioned that you have a lot of ambitions for the future. What are your ambitions um, for aquaculture, and how might this transition period and these ambitions um, have an impact on um, rights for approving and consenting to fish farms, for example? If I say that, first of all, the, the consenting of fish farms um, is no longer part of the Crown Estate stream. It's done through local authorities in Marine Scotland. So um, that, that's an evolution. It's something that the Crown Estate used to be involved in. It's not. Uh, I think that separation of duties is actually quite useful and quite, quite valuable. Um, so far as uh, taking the industry forward, it, it's a, a challenge that we have um, asked ourselves as to where we can look to make a, an investment that would have a direct line of sight to increase production. And that's something that we're, we're currently looking at. It's, it's not as straightforward as people might, might think to, to see a way of uh, making a, a direct investment that, that creates value like that. Uh, we continue to, to fund various um, research pro projects um, in, in respect to parasites. Um, to maximise the existing um, uh, fleet of um, uh, aquaculture sites, as it were. Uh, we're doing what we can to encourage new sites and identify those, but we have challenged ourselves to find ways where we can actively invest that would see a, an increase in production and, and therefore an increase in capital and an increase in revenue, to be honest. It's self virtuous I wonder if I could just add that, Ms Forbes, um, just last month our aquaculture manager Alex Adrian and myself went up to Perth to meet uh, the chair lady Anne McCall and chief executive of Scott Lansborough of Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation just to speak exactly about these um, issues or opportunities, be more accurate, that Ronnie's just referred to. We are very aware of the, um, the target set by Scottish Government for the salmon industry, and we will do everything we can to facilitate that. And on another uh, um, industry, um, although allied industry, Alex and I are going to see the uh, Scottish shellfish producers just shortly, again, with, to try and develop a, a blueprint to drive that industry forward. There's enormous appetite for the quality shellfish production coming out of Scotland. So we're very engaged with industry and really trying to boost opportunities for them. 
brief supplementary from Dave Stewart. Quick point, uh, convener. I, I recently had a briefing from two biologists from UHI about um, closed containment for aquaculture. I just wonder whether Mr. Quinn or any of his colleagues has done any work on that particular issue. In other words, having um, aquaculture out with locks because of the issues to do with pollution and sea lice. Um, by which you mean land-based? Yes. It, it's not something, because it's not connected to the Crown Estate assets, it's not something that, that's directly uh, something that we would invest in or with, would be within our varies to invest in, to be honest. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on finally to deal with energy. I know Mark Ruskell has a number of questions he wants to ask, but before we do that, can I um, refer you, uh, Mr Quinn, to one of the comments in you've got in the, in the annual report and you reference the, uh, that there's been substantial support to the offshore renewable sector but that it'll be nearer 2020 before we start to see the real returns from this. Could you kind of expand upon that and advise us what sort of sums we're talking about? I mean, I think what I'm getting at is, is the gov Scottish Government in for a nice surprise in terms of income in a couple of years' time? <laughs> Well, I, I'm glad to have the opportunity to, to quote the numbers that I have traditionally quoted to, to uh, uh, predecessing uh, uh, committees. Um, for, uh, to be honest, the, the big numbers will come from, at this point in time, offshore wind. And uh, for round three sites, and that would include the Morrill site in the Murray Firth and the Sea Green site, in the Outer Forth and Tay, the expected revenue um, based on 2020 values would be in the region of £7.6 million pounds per annum per gigawatt. Uh, for non-round three sites, we'd be looking at something in the region of £4.3 million pounds per gigawatt per annum. Uh, for wave and tidal sites, uh, if we're looking at those, the uh, numbers are looking something in the region of about £30,000 per annum per, for a 10 megawatt site. So uh, the numbers are deliberately scaled because the, um, the, the opportunity or the numbers in respect of weight and tidal are much, much smaller at this point in time. And put in simple terms, what do you anticipate that would mean by way of income? Well, if I say that um, the, the Beatrice site, um, roughly speaking, is about um, half a gigawatt, and we would expect that to start uh, first energy in 2019, mm -hmm. should all go uh, according to plan. Um, the, the sites in the Outer Forth and Tay, as members will be aware, is another matter. Yes, because we have a problem there. The, the, there's a, a, an ongoing uh, uh, judicial issue in respect of that, yeah. Okay. Mark Roscoe. Um, I'm interested in, in the area around cost reduction, because obviously that's a big issue for offshore renewables, how, how we get a more competitive industry. Um, I mean, what, what kind of work are you doing on that at, at the moment, and how does that then feed into the the broader strategy of the, of the Scottish Government's forthcoming energy strategy. Yeah. Uh, State, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, cost reduction is key uh, for not just the offshore wind, but also the, the wave and tidal sectors to be competitive going forward. Um, Crown State took part in and, and indeed published its own report in respect of um, reducing the levelised cost of energy. Uh, so there's a fairly weighty tome that's in the office, complete with uh, quite a, a full CD of uh, date supporting data behind that, uh, pointing out where, where the savings can be can come from. And it's fair to say there's no silver bullet in respect of, in respect of this. It's uh, incremental uh, improvements in, in lots of areas. And, and we're starting to see that, and the benefits of that are now coming through. Uh, we also published a supply chain guide uh, and for anyone uh, looking to uh, introduce themselves to the supply chain, uh, uh, that effectively built, uh, sets out your business plan, frankly. Um, so the levelised cost of energy for offshore wind has come down dramatically over the past number of years. Um, uh, offshore wind uh, w was 
often quoted at over £150 per megawatt hour. Um, the, the cost of the levelised cost of energy for some of the the, the, the latest um, Danish projects uh, or Dutch projects rather was down to um, the high 70s in, in respect of that. Now I accept we're not comparing uh, like with like there because there are some transmission issues uh, and transmission costs that are different there, and um, there's a different. Uh, consenting regime that, that applies there. But the, we have seen evidence of costs coming down dramatically. The next auction for CFDs is due to be announced within the next number of weeks uh, and um, will be given a, a guide as to what the, the level is there. I would expect that to be significantly lower than the, the previous number. So um, I know that we are working with our developers to help structure uh, ac across the board, uh, to help structure um, documentation to support their, their bids mm -hmm. going forward. So uh, the levelised cost of energy is dropped by uh, at least a third, mm -hmm. in fairness, so that which, which is a, 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 a huge um, gain for the industry, to be honest, because the original uh, electricity market reform uh, process was uh, set out to identify a route to the industry obtaining £100 per megawatt hour by 2020. We're going to be exceeding that in 2016. So you've been you know, very closely embedded with government energy policy and also with the industry for a number of years. What would you expect then that would come through this new setup? Would you expect very explicit ministerial direction in relation to the work that you're doing around energy in terms of the research, in terms of the collaborative work? Are you effectively an offshore arm of Scottish Government's energy policy? Um, again, I don't mean to sound uh, like a broken record here, but it will be for the new board and for the ministers to determine where, where we focus. I certainly see huge opportunities here to take that further forward in certain areas not across the board, and I think there, there are areas where I think it would be useful for the new entity to focus its attention on uh, uh, where I think that there's a route to market and where we can identify an opp opportunities that are unique to Scotland. I think we have to play to Scotland's strengths. So where your, your strengths and weaknesses as an organisation in terms of your capacity, the staff, the team that you've got in place, the team that you hope to get in place, where would you see uh, as being the areas where you can make the greatest contribution in terms of being that delivery arm, potentially, of Scottish Government policy? Um, I, I think in respect of, um, to be honest, being a, a, a trusted advisor on where, where we can identify those, we're already looking at areas um, that we would be happy to recommend the new entity take very seriously and go forward with, and we're already in discussions with colleagues in Scottish Government, with colleagues in SDI, with colleagues uh, in uh, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and I'm saying that that way because I, I don't know how to say the acronym. Um, but we're, we're working with colleagues across the piece on where we can identify opportunities in Scotland where, uh, as I say, we'll play to Scotland's strengths. And, and we've got the people uh, within Bellsbury to do that. I'm confident of that. Golden. Uh, I'm just wondering on your assessment, and, and you've touched on this in terms of uh, revenue projections, particularly on tidal, but also wave, um, and whether there was any thoughts about when that may uh, begin to to make a some sort of uh, decent contribution to your overall revenues. Is that something you've looked at? Yes, it is. Um, the tidal uh, sector, uh, and I think it's sensible to, to separate these at this point in time, the tidal sector is, is starting to see its way through uh, commercially, and the, there's the recent announcement of the um, tidal uh, development in Shetland at Blue Mill Sound by Nova Innovations. They now have two uh, tidal turbines, two 100 kilowatt tidal turbines operating on a much larger scale. The committee will be aware of the Magen project in the uh, Pentland Firth, 
where the Crown Estate have committed a £10 million investment into, into that project. That's now well advanced and we're expecting uh, offshore works uh, with regards to deployment of devices to be starting within the next number of weeks. The offshore cables have already been laid. I was up there myself um, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, having a look at the, the onshore substation and, and how, that, how that was working. Um, and that, that's all looking very positive. Key to that is going to be the, how that, these projects are seen by the investment community at large. Because while I think it's been right that um, the public sector has invested heavily in these projects up until now, and I still think that that's something that, that should continue going forward, um, it has to be with an eye to um, these projects reducing their costs and uh, becoming much more self-sufficient and bringing in third, uh, you know, private sector finance going forward. Um, with regards to the wave sector, um, I think it's fair to say, um, and I'm speaking at a conference, uh, Scottish Renewables Conference about this next week, I think it's fair to say that the technology isn't quite as advanced yet commercially for wave, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, electricity can be generated using the power of the waves, but it's doing that on a consistent and commercial basis that's yet to be um, proven, to be honest. Um, as to when that will start to, to go forward, we're waiting on the right technology, to be honest. Okay. 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 Uh, gentlemen, can I thank you for attending today? It's been a very useful session. These are clearly um, challenging, but also very exciting times for the uh, Crown Estate. I think as we've heard today, there's clearly opportunities going forward for you to operate in, in different, better, more effective ways. And I think we as a committee look forward to engaging with you and the government over the coming months and years uh, to look at that. So thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again in future. Thank you. We'll now take a five-minute break uh, for the swap over of witnesses for the second panel.
Okay, uh, we'll now resume. Uh, can I welcome the uh, second panel of witnesses? We have Linda Rosborough, Director of Marine Scotland, and David Mallon, Head of Crown Estate Strategy Unit, Marine Scotland, and Scottish Government. Welcome to you both. Um, I'll kick things off. Can I ask what due diligence the Scottish Government has done around what it's inheriting from the Crown Estate, both in terms of asset value and liabilities. You may have heard, if you were in earlier, about questions around uh, potential backlog on tenancy repairs. So I'd just like an understanding of what work's been done to inform your view of, of what you're inheriting. Well, I'll kick off, but um, this is obviously a complicated issue because it is a very large estate and a rather complex estate. Um, but we have um, secured the services of external consultants on the Crown Estate have made available to us um, information on their um, 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 tenancies, assets, um, documentation around their um, holdings and relationships with their leases. Um, we've had an um, initial report on that just in, in August, at the end of August, and we're just sorting through some of the details arising from that at the moment. David, do you want to come in on that? Yes, uh, thank you. I think it's also worthwhile highlighting that this isn't really um, a normal kind of commercial oh, uh, transaction. Comes on automatically. Ah. I think it's uh, worth highlighting that this isn't a, a normal um, uh, commercial uh, transaction. Um, it's a government-to-government -government type transfer. Therefore, you know, full-scale commercial due diligence um, you know, is not really our objective here, but we have been looking to uh, you know, best ensure that we are aware of um, any issues and any liabilities. Um, and you know, primarily, um, we think that uh, the devolution will also provide an opportunity to secure the position and uh, manage the liabilities for the future in a way that is appropriate for, for Scotland. Okay, uh, and we'll come on to that, but how would you, at this early stage, characterise the, the, what it is you're inheriting, what sort of condition it's in? Well, there are duties in the Scotland Act to maintain the estate as an estate in land, which in kind of practical terms uh, means that we have to carry out maintenance um, and uh, look for opportunities for investment uh, once the, the assets are devolved uh, to Scotland. So th those are obviously um, you know, kind of liabilities in the technical sense that uh, have to be um, honoured. Um, and uh, there are also the uh, potential um, implications uh, should things go wrong with uh, an investment uh, in part of the estate, even though um, the, the strategy is to ensure that those liabilities are managed and, uh, uh, and, uh, the, and, and sit with the appropriate um, body, um, there is the possibility of um, uh, liabilities you know, stemming back to, uh, to the, the interim body as, as is envisaged or potentially ultimately Scottish ministers uh, if, if those um, liabilities being managed by other parties cannot, uh, cannot be funded. So those... Yeah, if I could add, it's one of the active um, subjects of discussion between us and the, and the Treasury. Um, the Crown Estate has been, over the years, good at ensuring that as they've taken on additional responsibilities, they have ensured that they, um, other parts of, of government who were interested in those taking on those responsibilities took on the liabilities. Um, so one of the, um, one of the issues that's arisen around, around that is in respect of um, offshore uh, renewable energy, and that's been an issue that has come up in relation to DEC. Um, we're also pursuing the issue of any liabilities in relation to MOD use of assets, mm -hmm. which could be could be an issue as well. But these are quite live and 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 um, you know, issues that are ongoing, unresolved at the moment. Yeah. Right, thank you. We still have to agree the transfer scheme with the Treasury as an essential prerequisite to the devolution of the powers in relation to the Crown Estate. Uh, so let's deal with that now then. Um, what is the latest position regarding the drafting of the transfer scheme and the timelines you're working to? Um, on, on that, um, we are still in active dialogue. We had hoped that we would have had a further draft um, further to the one which the previous committee saw, but we have not yet had that. I, I wrote last in, in, in detail in June 
to, to the Treasury with a set of, of, of requests, picking up some of the points that have been made um, by committees of this Parliament and also in relation to um, stakeholder views and other technical matters. So we're still awaiting a further draft of the transfer scheme. That seems rather a delay, does it not? It is slower than we had expected, yes. Okay. And do you feel that the Scottish Government's been able to um, contribute to the development of the, the transfer scheme adequately in a general sense? Um, the, um, it certainly was not um, as originally envisaged that this would be a sort of a joint process. Um, we have seen some um, movement in the Treasury. They have responded positively to some points we have made, but it was never a joint process. Um, the transfer scheme, as proposed, goes beyond what Smith recommended in that it has a lot of um, quite um, constraining detail proposed to be within it, um, which Smith recommended should be for a, a, a memorandum of understanding in terms of how the um, interests of national infrastructure were safeguarded, for example. And it um, also leaves out certain properties which ministers are not happy with and, and, and other matters. David, do you want to add anything to that? I think you summarised the position quite well. Um, we are awaiting um, uh, an updated draft of the transfer scheme, uh, and uh, we are informed that uh, it will be supplied by the end of September, uh, and okay. that the Treasury is still you know, working to a timescale, despite that delay, uh, to enable the transfer uh, by, the, by, by the 1st of April. On the subject of su perhaps surprise emissions, um, is there any movement at all on Fort Kinnaird? Um, is that still being discussed? Have we given up on that? Where do we stand? Um, there is no movement on, on, on that. Um, we can continue to press the issue. You are pressing it? Yes. Yes, right, thank you. I've got a number of colleagues who want to come in on this. Uh, Dave Stewart. Uh, can, I, can I raise the philosophical point? Um, would you argue that the Crown Estate protects the public interest. I mean, I had a quick glance before I came out um, this, this morning, and over the last few years, there's been two or three areas of, of conflict. For example, with salmon farmers in Shetland, conflict over the moorings in Rossi, and conflict with salmon fishing rights in the River Yarrow and Selkirk. Uh, conflict's been a part of this issue. I mean, some argue, I'm not necessarily saying I agree with this, that you are just another absentee landlord and that you're not actually looking after the rights of tenants or rights of uh, community land organisations. How would you respond to that? Well, um, I think, I mean, obviously, we're not Crown Estate. Um, we, we're, we're working for the Scottish Government looking at, at, at change. Um, the, the, the position at present is that the Crown Estate is required under the legislation under which they operate to pursue a sort of commercial objective, maximising the economic return to the Treasury. So um, an issue for the Scottish Parliament in future is whether in terms of the management of the estate, regardless of, 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 of who manages it, for what purpose should it be managed? And um, I think that's, that's the question that maybe underpins some of the issues that you're highlighting. I should also say that from my sort of day job responsibility for Marine Scotland, conflict in the marine environment is, is, is part and parcel of, of, of what happens quite a lot of the time. Yeah. You spoke with feeling on that. Yes. <laughs> OK, uh, Alexander Burnett. Good morning. Um, just on the valuation question again, as I'm sure you're hearing, um, uh, getting the most accurate uh, valuation, be it statutory or red book, uh, given this will form the baseline, is obviously very important uh, in the process. Uh, can you clarify two points? Um, we, we heard from the earlier panel that the uh, valuations are normally done in the third quarter or towards the end of the year, uh, with the transfer being 1st of April, I believe. Uh, what will be the timing of evaluation in terms of this, this first and most important valuation? Uh, and secondly, um, in terms of transparency, what uh, publication of evaluation and what breakdown will there be? Will it just be by activity, uh, as in the current report, or will it be uh, by more detail, by asset? Um, I would say that uh, we've, we've started from a process of seeking to understand the, um, the, the, the assets, um, the financial processes within the Crown Estate better, and we've been working on that and moving in a, in a positive direction. Um, up until now, the Crown Estate has obviously operated on a, on a UK-wide basis, so, um, and, and 
the assets are, are complex and the information isn't always ready, ready to hand, um, is, 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 is the sort of underpinning situation. Um, David, can you come in on where exactly we are now in terms of that process? Yes, um, I think it's important also to highlight that um, the assets are the assets. And so there is obviously a connection with the, the point of transfer and knowing you know, at that point you know, the, the best estimate of what their value is. But the most significant question, uh, point, I think, is that um, the assets will be transferred over to the control of Scotland and, be, and ultimately reporting to Scottish Parliament. So uh, any valuation exercise either in advance of or after um, the, the transfer will be able to take account of changes in the, the, the valuation of individual assets, but the, the actual control is the, is the is a major, I think, um, um, you know, development arising from the, the transfer. Um, there's a, a set process uh, f that the Crown Estate is normally involved in to periodically you know, uh, value uh, any changes uh, in, in the asset base um, in terms of, kind of buildings and properties. Uh, there's also the, the valuation you know, of, of an asset, you know, like a, a portion of the seabed associated with a third party agreement. Uh, those are obviously, you know, uh, different. Uh, and as Linda said earlier, the diversity of the portfolio does create a challenge in having um, a, a, a valuation which is bang up to date across the entire estate. Uh, but there, there will be an opportunity to, um, to better understand this has been significant change between the, the last valuation and the, and the transfer date. Assets that can't be measured in financial terms, i.e. the people who work in the Crown Estate. I'm just wondering two points around that. Uh, how confident are you that the transition is being managed well for their benefit, keeping them on board, keeping them informed? And also, what uh, effort will you put in to listening to the staff of the Crown Estate, who may very well, with their experience, have some excellent ideas about how the organisation could work more effectively in the future? I'll start this one. Um, we have a, a formal joint project with the uh, Crown Estate to, to look at um, the process of change. Um, we actually hold our, our, our formal program management meetings in the Crown Estate premises in, in Bells Bray, so we're always there and, and, and visible to staff. And we're working through um, a, a number of different work streams around um, HR issues, IT issues, other process issues, financial management issues, looking to ensure that we have a good basis for um, transition to the, to the new arrangements. And um, I'm a senior responsible owner for, for, for that process and the arrangements are, are, are working well at, at the moment. Um, David perhaps is a little bit closer to the, to the staff views and can come in on that one. Yes. Sir. Again, I, I would first of all highlight that um, the, the staff are a very important part of the business, you know, the knowledge base, you know, given that diversity in the portfolio. So it is very important that we do uh, you know, uh, uh, best ensure the, the transfer in terms of you know, a, a smooth uh, you know, navigation for staff. And, uh, and they're you know, uh, very much you know, taken account of when it comes to the, the people element of the work programme. Uh, that, that Linda described and thinking through all the issues to ensure that we comply with the duties uh, in the Scotland Act over no detriment, but also you know, act as, um, uh, the, act as the, you know, the, the, on behalf of the new employer to ensure that um, their welfare is, is taken into account and that's involving a lot of joint working uh, with the Crown Estate uh, and also the Crown Estate itself is looking for opportunities uh, to provide background information on the latest state of play when significant developments have arisen. Uh, so that's, that's also, uh, we understand, uh, uh, proving uh, you know, beneficial to employees and understanding what the process involves, what the timing is, to provide that reassurance on what the direction of travel is. And the Crown Estate has been helpful in um, ensuring that they have um, created a core body of staff that cover the functions that need to be covered by the new body. Whereas to start with, um, there was a, some functions that were done out with Scotland and some within Scotland, and they have um, reorganised so that they are in a position that we have the skills that are needed 
um, based in Scotland so that we can move forward with, with confidence. Okay. Yes, of course. Answer you go. Um, I appreciate the difficulties with timing and valuations. Um, I was really trying to make the point. I hope you appreciate that the uh, performance of Crown Estate Scotland in terms of return on capital will be based on when the baseline uh, starts, and that's, that was, was really the point of that. Um, the second part um, was, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if I had an answer to the publication of the of valuations, and will it be by activity or by, uh, by further breakdown by asset? In terms of, I think, if you're referring to the Scotland report that uh, is normally produced uh, by the Crown Estate and pr provides that, that yes, yes, uh, that one, uh, um, I think we will be looking to at whether there's any opportunities to provide more detailed information, uh, part of uh, you know, an overall uh, direction of travel to look for new opportunities for increased transparency. Uh, we haven't got a blueprint on what the new report looks like, but I think there's an opportunity to be uh, a bit more detailed. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Good morning to you both. And uh, in a previous um, Life in the Rural Affairs Committee, I and others asked about um, the mission statement of the Crown Estate. And um, it was suggested um, in the previous committee that um, there might be possibilities for looking at that again in relation to um, some issues around um, sustainable development and possibly environmental stewardship. Um, I would also add um, community involvement. Um, there may be other issues that other committee members would want to highlight. I'm, I'm wondering, um, has there been any work done on this? I appreciate there's going to be an interim uh, board and, and all that, and where the responsibility of, of Scottish ministers lie, but it does seem very important in terms of looking to the future as to um, how this work could be developed and who would be engaged in it. Yes, um, I mean, I think that's um, a very valid point. I've, I referred um, initially to the fact that on um, transfer, the 1961 Act provision yeah. still applies, so the, the statutory purpose for which the assets have to be managed remains the same as, as, as at present. Um, obviously, ministers um, are looking to um, ensure that we have um, a body that, wor that works for Scotland as, a, as an interim body as, you know, as fast as possible. Um, and um, in, in setting up the proposed arrangements, um, the criteria which, which ministers have agreed that they're looking for in terms of people to be, um, or the, the chair and, and, and subsequently people to be on that body, you're looking for a, a range of skills that would encompass some of these elements. Right, I, I understand that, but if I can just press you a bit further on that, because it's quite clear, obviously, in relation to the, the Act, the um, 61 Act, that there is a statutory responsibility, but beyond that, is there any reason why um, it would be inappropriate for Scottish ministers to make additions to, um, to, to that uh, along the lines that I've highlighted and others highlighted in the previous committee, to broaden out the, the mission statement? Um, I think ministers can, can, can look at the, the sort of framework documentation for the new body with, with that very much in mind, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the fundamental purpose is, 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 is still there, though, which would need to be properly taken into account. Thank you. If I could just add that uh, through a consultation on the long-term framework uh, for management of the assets, there could be you know, opportunities to um, amend that, that legal duty that will exist in the interim to think about you know, other... Uh, drivers like socio-economic benefit and uh, environmental um, responsibility. But also, uh, as, as uh, I was hearing in the latter stages of the, the evidence session uh, just beforehand, um, the, the Crown Estate is already uh, contributing in some way, shape or form to the delivery of environmental objectives. I think we're talking about a, a question of degrees here and you know, the extent to which that can be enhanced in future through the interim arrangements we'll be kind of looking at that opportunity within the legal framework and also for, for the future. So there's, uh, I think it's, it's uh, more like a direction of travel and, uh, and, and degrees of, of uh, contribution rather than a black and white situation. Mark Druskell. The, the objectives that might be um, put onto this new body are refined on the back of the 61 Act. The other side of that is the ministerial direction powers that will come through this ministerial body, sorry, this new interim body. Um, 
how exactly would you envisage those being used? I mean, are we looking at something along the lines of Scottish Water, where there's high-level objectives, strategic investment programme, et cetera? Or are we looking at something a bit more detailed? Um, I think... I mean, you highlight direction powers. Direction powers tend to be powers of last resort, which are, you know, in, in themselves not used. Um, but um, in terms of um, the, the framework, um, I, I think we'd be looking at general objectives within which the body would work in the first instance. But that would need to be agreed by ministers. And that's right, so you're saying it, it, powers of last resort, so you wouldn't Powers of direction generally in the, in the public in. sector tend to be oh. powers of, of, of last resort. It's not okay. something that ministers are issuing um, on, a, on, a, on a routine basis. Generally, you provide frameworks within which organisations operate. Mm -hmm. So how would the Scottish Government envisage working with that new framework then as an independent board? Would the Scottish Government be represented on that board? How do ministers exert influence in terms of the delivery of those objectives in a practical sense if actually ministerial directions are a last resort at the end of the day? Well, they would set... I mean, what generally happens is they set for, forward a, a framework. Um, there will also be some... Um, one would envisage some sort of um, restrictions, for example, um, in relation to abilities to sell assets that or novel or contentious matters that might need particular agreement with ministers. That's a fairly normal um, set of, of circumstances. Um, and in the um, decisions around the appointment of the board um, and the chair, um, that would also be um, you know, ministers setting their um, um, sort of direction of travel in terms of um, the body that was being set up. Okay. Could I just give one example of that? When we were at the Apple Growth Estate last week, there seemed to be some you know, ongoing flood management issues which were being partly resolved with, with the tenants and, and, and uh, the agents and everybody else. But what there was lacking was a strategic approach to river basin management planning. Now, that's the kind of thing I would expect a public body just to slot straight into that wider strategic work. Um, Is that something that ministers would go, oh, hang yeah. on a minute, you know, this isn't happening we want to see more good practice here. We want, want to see benchmarking with other public sector organisations on that kind of work. I think, I mean, that the, the ability to align public policy better with other parts of the public sector is one of the, one of the big opportunities on, on, on devolution. Um, obviously, subject to the constraints of um, the commercial remit, which it, it will have at, at the outset, and, and the need to ensure that its assets are properly managed. Um, I would imagine there will be quite a lot of tensions, particularly in the in the early um, um, in the early period, um, because um, people will a lot, a lot of people will be looking to see change for the things that they've maybe been unhappy with for some time, and, and that in itself will need to be carefully managed. Um, and ministers wouldn't wish to be drawn into day-to-day -day decisions on um, individual um, tenancies and, and, and leases. I think it's proper that ministers should be at one removed from that. Okay, uh, talking about stakeholders, Dave Stewart. Vina, um, change can obviously be very threatening to stakeholders and leaseholders. Um, what are you doing to reassure uh, stakeholders and leaseholders through the change management period? Um, the way in which we've approached the whole change management has been about um, ensuring that we both retain knowledge and expertise and, and, and key um, ability and capability so that the delivery of the services is, is, is as smooth as possible. And that's been a very strong um, objective of ministers um, right from the start, while at the same time providing um, a good platform for um, the future direction of travel, um, which um, may, may well be different and, and, and take us in a, in a, in a different direction. So ensuring that we um, ma manage those two aspects has been key to how we've gone about it. Um, those stakeholders are involved in our stakeholder advisory group. David has met um, a number of different representatives and we've, we've tried to um, ensure that they are, are fully involved. One of the issues that they do have of concern is sort of cross-subsidy and the fact that um, some of the... Um, some sectors are, um, and, and particularly the, the, the tenants, are um, perhaps um, subsidised by um, resources coming from elsewhere in the portfolio. Um, and that's one of the issues that we do need to address in, mm. in, in thinking about future arrangements. Mm. David, do you want to come in on the specifics? Well, I know you've met that 
Yes, uh, first of all, on the stakeholder advisory group, you know, that uh, is you know, very much designed so that the individual um, sectors uh, and interests that rely upon the Crown Estate at present for a service can um, can help influence what the, the future opportunities are and, uh, and it's also it's a, it's a space for them to raise any concerns they have uh, here and now so it's very important to us um, as, a, as a set of discussions uh, mm. in, in terms of understanding what the issues are and what the opportunities are and in addition to that um, we are you know, uh, trying to you know, provide open lines of communication to individual uh, stakeholder representatives uh, so that mm. uh, we can um, you know, understand the concerns they have so that we can hopefully address mm -hmm. them in the short term or through the, the consultation and ensure mm -hmm. a smooth transfer in the meantime. Have any of the issues that have been raised by stakeholders been a surprise to you? You mentioned cross-subsidy has been one of them earlier. Has there been any other issues raised that you were maybe not shocked but certainly surprised that stakeholders were raising? Not necessarily a surprise to us. I mean, I think it, the dynamics of the group are also interesting in that it's been uh, possible for individual members to you know, more clearly understand what the views of other sectors are and that I think has helped in terms of understanding what the, 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 the opportunities are for the future. Mm. Right. Thank you. Mm. Well, there is a fundamental concern there amongst the agricultural tenants that depending on how this plays out there may be less of a pot there for their interest to be protected. How aware are you of those concerns? Aware of them, um, they weren't, as I say, a surprise uh, no. to me. Um, um, but that, that's very much part of the, the set of discussions to understand what the, the existing kind of maintenance uh, requirements are, what the future ones are, and the way in which uh, those uh, uh, obligations can be fulfilled so that we are complying with the, the duties in the Act in respect of, 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 those, uh, okay. of those needs. Thank you. I mean, we're going to really drill down into the, the operations of the interim body and the longer term management arrangements now. But just as we do that, can I ask about both in terms of the interim period and the long term, what uh, measures will be put in place to ensure that the performance of the Crown Estate internally is measured appropriately in the way other public bodies would be measured? Um, so, that, for example, and I use this just as one example, you know, how, how responsive are they to approaches from agricultural tenants for um, repairs? How long does that take, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. An overall performance framework. Are you minded to put that in place for them? It's uh, part of the the, the, you know, the set of discussions we want to have with the new interim body. Referring back to what Linda said about the framework, and um, that would involve. Um, Normally, the kind of objectives uh, and targets being developed by um, a, a public body for approval by Scottish ministers, with ministers able to influence those targets and add in new ones. Uh, um, so, given the importance of the, the staff base for successful delivery, um, that is something that would be open to, you know, um, um, uh, to, to uh, looking at. We haven't got that far yet, is the honest answer in terms of the, the transfer we're focused upon day one and uh, and, and uh, ensuring the first year um, does not result in uh, stakeholders and customers uh, receiving a, a, a reduced service. Okay, that's fine. So moving on to the interim body and how it will work, uh, Maurice Golden. I wonder if you can just highlight the plans, processes and timescales for the setup of the interim body. Um, yes, um, well, the plans um, very much, you know, focused on trying to uh, make it possible for the new body to take on functions uh, from uh, April next year. Um, that requires um, further legislation at Westminster, the transfer scheme, to actually affect the transfer, uh, and uh, it also would require the, the, the legal establishment of uh, the interim body uh, through secondary legislation um, at, at uh, the Scottish Parliament. Uh, the, the process is also involved that joint working uh, with the Crown Estate to, uh, in simple terms, although it's very complex, you know, move from a situation where the Scottish operation is managed as part of a UK-wide setup and can receive services and support uh, and headquarter functions from that UK body to a position where uh, the, the, the new body has the, the, the necessary systems and uh, services uh, you know, installed at, at Bellsbury. That's uh, another kind of key component um, of, of our work moving towards the 1st of April 
uh, I could expand a little bit uh, on the, the wider timescales, if that would be useful, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, in parallel with that propriety work for the interim body uh, that we're engaged in, uh, we also want to uh, demonstrate um, early action on what the future may look like. Uh, so, you know, the, the April timescale is focused, about, focused on trying to deliver devolution to Scotland as soon as possible through that legal process set up in, in the Scotland Act. Um, and uh, that's to try and reduce uncertainty as much as possible for s stakeholders, investors and staff. And likewise, you know, there's, a, there's a degree of uncertainty about what the future will look like in the longer term. So we are aiming to uh, launch a consultation uh, later this year on the, uh, the options uh, for long-term management of the, the assets. And thinking about things from a quite a practical point of view, uh, I'm aware that you know in the past when agencies have received a devolved status, there's a great opportunity there to one better reflect the Scottish government's overall uh, view. And I think Mark's alluded to some of those aspects, and that should be uh, welcomed. But also an opportunity to be more innovative, uh, an opportunity to connect better with relevant stakeholders by virtue of the, the, the size. Um, but are you aware of how, for example, um, the civil service currently interacts uh, with the Crown Estate and uh, how you would envisage that going on? Because it is a concern that where we've seen agencies being devolved in the past, suddenly the uh, levels of, of scrutiny, um, not by a, a, a public committee, but by the civil servants, clogs up um, various processes and suddenly it's very difficult to, to achieve the aims, which I'm sure we all uh, wish. So I'm wondering how aware you are of the, the current interaction and how you view that going forward. Well, I mean, at the moment, it's a, it's a UK body mm -hmm. and answering to the Crown Estate Commissioners and there will be change and the Scottish Government has proposed that that's an NDP, sorry, that's a statutory corporation um, with, a, um, um, with a board and um, so it, that will be the governance framework. That does mean that there isn't the day-to-day -day, um, intrusion that you might expect if it were sort of brought within the, 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 the Scottish Government that some people might have um, have, have suggested it, it does give it um, um, a bit of flexibility working within a framework to, to, to do the job of, of, of delivery. Um, I think there'll be a lot of expectations because people are rightly you know, looking forward to the devolution mm -hmm. of the Crown State around Scotland, often for different reasons in different parts of Scotland. So um, I think there's going to be quite a lot of challenge around um, you know, both ensuring that the benefits are delivered and also managing those expectations. And I think that will require quite, quite a lot of work um, at the same time as ensuring you know, the day job is delivered. Quite a lot of the day-to-day -day work is done through managing agents. Um, the core staff is actually very small um, and those, those um, systems have been set up um, um, on, a, on a contractual basis. So much of that work um, will, will, will con continue um, in, in relation to that. And will you be considering a, a scheme of delegation so that we have transparency over who's able to do what, who's responsible for uh, you know, things like land transactions, for example, at, at what appropriate level uh, they would be signed off? Yes. yes. Can I just pick up the Deputy Convener's point about innovation? Um, in the earlier session, we asked the Crown Estate if they had given any thought as to in, in moving into this process, they would bring forward ideas about how they could operate more effectively and in better ways, given their expertise. And I think the phrase was used, we wouldn't present a blank sheet of paper. So they have given some thought to that. Are, is this government geared up to listen to that and to work actively with them to, to implement some of these changes for the benefit of everybody? Um, yes, I can certainly say that um, in... in um my engagement with um, Crown Estate um, staff um, who live and work in, in Scotland, um, there, there is a, um, you know, an, an obvious um, sense of um, expectation around, around change that enables them to do um, a better job for the people of Scotland. And I, I think that, that, that sort of 
um, comes across. Um, um, ministers are, I mean, Ms. Cunningham is, is, is meeting with staff soon, and uh, you know, I think we, we have created the opportunities for that dialogue. That being said, obviously there is the Smith Commission um, overall um, setting out of the position in relation to the future of the Crown Estate that needs to be worked through thoroughly, and that will mean that staff do feel a bit uncertain. Um, and what um, we are committed to doing is, is, is setting out the, the options for, for consultation going forward. Um, and a lot of people are very um, aware of the um, expertise that rests within the, the Crown Estate core and the opportunities that, that, that flow from that potentially for Scotland and the need to safeguard that going forward. Okay, uh, Claudia Beamish. Convener, uh, it's a, a follow-up question um, related to accountability with the interim board, and um, I'm wondering if um, there are yet plans as to how that will um, be transparent to the general public, and whether there'll be written um, reports, and whether those will be put on a website, and uh, if you've had any discussions about that, because obviously that would seek that would help to reassure um, the whole range of. Um, those involved who we've been um, uh, touching on today? I mean, we would expect normal procedures of, of, of openness to apply subject to the commercial confidentiality, which there can be around um, uh, you know, a number of, 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 of issues re relevant to the management of the Crown Estate. Thank you. And, uh, Alexander? Um, clearly an exciting time of a transfer. Um, I see the closing date for applications for the chair was yesterday. Uh, can you give an indication of how many people applied for the job? We have had applications, I know that. I don't know if I've got the, the, the final figure. I don't have it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Could you outline for us the thinking around allowing the Crown Estate to borrow money? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I, I'm, I'm as I understand it, there may be an opportunity for the Crown Estate to borrow money going forward, Crown Estate of Scotland, which hasn't been up until now, is that correct? Yes, um, that's right. Um, and it's really you know, stemming from our wish to best ensure that there can be a going concern approach mm -hmm. to the transfer and that uh, there's flexibility uh, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, kind of what, make the most of the assets and to ensure that uh, there's a security a resilience uh, to funding so um, th that those are one of the oper that, that is one example of I think you know the the inefficiencies or uh, that were seen in the 1961 act by um, Crown and state staff uh, and given the the age of that piece of legislation and the you know the fact that there's less you know uh, detail than we would ideally like on the origins of that control we've been looking at the the, the possibility of that uh, that flexibility being introduced to the, the devolved setup. Okay. Uh, and just by way of guidance for this committee, what and I realise this is difficult to quantify, perhaps, but what sort of timescales are you working to in terms of the secondary legislation that might come to us? Ballpark. Yeah, we're hoping now that the consultation closed on the 26th of August on this, this, the, the secondary legislation proposals uh, to be able to analyse them very quickly in a matter of weeks and hopefully, you know, uh, in the autumn, um, um, October, you know, uh, ideally uh, to be able to in, uh, lay that, uh, that, that, that order. That's our current timescale subject to uh, ministerial approval, etc. Thank you. I think we've covered the interim body. Just Mark Russell, then. Convener, just a brief follow-up to that. I mean, okay, it's early days, you know, the consultation finished on the 26th, but out of the conclusions of that, are there any changes that you might want to make to the, the interim body as, as proposed in the consultation? Have there been any tweaks as a result of that consultation that you could point to at this point? Nothing specific at this stage in time. We will be producing a, 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 a summary of the, the responses along with the, uh, the draft order, and, and we're in the middle, really, really just starting that analysis to, to weigh up, you know, the, the contributions that have been provided to the consultation process. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be useful if we could get early sight of, of that. Yeah. Okay, that'd be good. I mean, clearly, your focus now is to get everything that you have to do, do done get things up and running, but I'm just wondering at this stage what pl uh, thoughts are being given to consulting on the longer term arrangements with the Crown Estate uh, and whether that would link into the proposed uh, Iwans legislation. 
quite a lot of thought has gone into the the consultation for the long term um, that has involved discussions with the stakeholder advisory group. There, there are some kind of key questions that you know I, I think we need to, you know, um, try and you know reach a view on a final view through the consultation, uh, and there are implications that you know flow from uh, the the to preferred um, you know way forward on, on on each of those issues. You know, uh, for example, we were discussing earlier uh, about you know should the the duty you know to Obtain the best consideration, the, the maximum commercial value, you know, for um, for the asset, uh, be the the controlling factor on decision making on sales or or on leasing of assets. Uh, looking forward into the long term, or is there you know a, a better you know um, approach to provide flexibility, for example, to take account of wider socio-economic benefit, wider economic benefit, the environmental you know issues uh, to provide a, a degree of flexibility is one you know. Um, Set of, of issues that um, is is um, something that we want to obtain wider views on, um, and and then you know coming to final decisions on uh, what the uh, you know further devolution opportunities look like and uh, who that you know uh, might be in terms of level of government or communities etc. Uh, thinking about how we can fulfil the duties um, in the uh, in the uh, the. The, the Scotland Act, uh, irrespective of what the 1961 Act uh, says, uh, to ensure that we're managing as an estate and land, uh, to come back to some of those uh, uh, points about uh, investment and, and maintenance, and to do that in a way that um, is efficient for Scotland to maximise the, you know, the benefits for Scotland are the, the themes that uh, we're um, exploring, and also how best to manage liabilities where they do exist or where they might exist is, is another. Uh, stream of, of thinking. Okay. And picking up what you asked about the islands, there's obviously a particularly strong appetite for early progress in the, in the islands, um, and they are pressing for um, what they what they call a, a pilot to, to sort of go ahead of, of, of other um, legislation. Um, we don't have the power at the moment um, to provide for a change specifically for the islands. That would only happen once we'd reached the point of the um, transfer having taken place. And um, that will be well into, into, into next year. So there are some sort of timing issues and, and challenges around that, as well as the principle of, of, of whether it would be sensible to do um, something in, in one place ahead of looking at the overall um, long-term future. Okay. So these will all be matters for the consultation. So, so, in essence, the opportunity to shape, to alter the future direction of the Crown Estate is very much going to be there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's that's good here. Can I just, I think, looking around, colleagues, I think they've asked everything they wanted to ask. Are there any areas you feel we haven't covered? Is there any comments that you want to make that would provide further insight into what's happening? Um, no, I don't think so. I think the key thing is the transfer scheme um, and ensuring that that is um, done in a, in, in a timely way, um, in, a, in a way in which um, the Scottish ministers are, are, are content because Scottish ministers need to agree to, to that transfer scheme. So that is the, the, the key um, going forward, ensuring that that is, is um, fit for purpose. And it's also going to be a key area of interest to the committee, I would suggest. So we would welcome being kept updated on the progress with regard to the transfer scheme as we go forward over the next few weeks and uh, and beyond that. So can I thank you for your attendance today? It's been most useful. Uh, I would thank the earlier panel as well. Um, the committee will now uh, move into private. Yes. Um, at its next meeting on the 13th of September, the committee will take evidence from the Committee on Climate Change on Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emission Targets and from the Clerk to the Scottish Parliament on its climate change and environmental policies. And as agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session. Can I ask the public gallery be cleared and the public part of the meeting is now closed.